So welcome to the January, welcome to 2021. And hopefully it'll be a better year than last year. Uh, we're, good, we're gonna continue doing the virtual show table for the, the short term future. We don't really know how long, I don't know how many, how long will it be till people get vaccinated and feel more comfortable going out. But for right now, we're gonna continue on with a, a virtual show table with a good Dr. Courtney Hackney, who is the only person I know that could really pull this off, that to, to talk about the plants every month would be so interesting. I learned something from Courtney every month. It's amazing. Um, I also like to welcome our new members, Teresa, Betty, Trace, Jane, and Priscilla. They come from far and wide, one from Massachusetts, one from South Carolina, one from Jacksonville, and the others from St. Augustine. So welcome to the St. Augustine Orchid Society. And welcome to our Master of Ceremonies, Courtney, who does the most fantastic job with the virtual show table. Well, you keep saying that. I'm going to have to keep doing it, huh? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, are, are we ready? I can't even remember how, the, how this worked the last time, but I seem to recall that I had a whole full screen and that's what I'm seeing now. So that's actually pretty good. Oh, that's good. Is everyone ready? Go to it. It, it. it ceases to amaze me, or maybe it never ceases to amaze me, how many of our local members grow these things that have the just the shriveled up bulbs and then flower like crazy? Sue, I think you got everyone started on this, everything from Cloesia to the whole uh, groups of, of related orchids that flower like this. We and, have a lot of catacetum freaks. Yep, and you have really gotten them to be able to grow these things. I mean, this Cloesia is pretty spectacular. Oh my God. Um, I looked at it and I, frankly, I've seen enough of these now that I wasn't sure if it was the same thing because it seemed like the, the form of this flower was way better than than most that I've seen in the past, and I had to look at look this thing up just to make sure this is what it was. And this is just a very very good one of this particular species. It's interesting that this species is a is a very warm to hot growing species because you don't I don't think of this group as being um, a group that grows in very hot conditions, but this one sure does and. It's sort of the perfect uh, place if you grow here in Florida, because we've got warm to hot a good bit of the year, except for the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, but this is a beautiful clone of it and being well grown by Suzanne. Yeah. Next. Beautiful. And we've, we've got a number of these uh, different species and hybrids. Fred Clark, Fred Clark Ara, After Dark. <laughs> it's the, it is the, true black orchid that everyone was searching for although i think that photograph shows you on the left that it's not truly black it's just so dark it looks black um just beautiful things and i still remember the first time i saw a picture and i actually didn't believe that was right um and then we yeah. have a, a cloacetum white magic and that's got the species that we saw before with catacetum orchid glade i, I have to say i'm fascinated that that so many of these interbreed. I really wouldn't have thought going into this that they would all be able to co-mingle in terms of genetics, but they sure seem to. You want to say something, Sue? Well, I think that, that I think that that's right. I know how many viable plants he gets when he does some of these oddball crosses. When Fred does some of these oddball crosses, I I, I don't know. I find that the Fred Clark eras have to be really big and really huge pseudobulbs to get good flowering on them. So the more complex the hybrid, I think the more uh, the more robust the plant has to be to throw off a good uh, bloom spike. Yeah, that may be true. That's not unusual for hybrids to sometimes take longer to bloom, especially when the genetics between the parents is not very close. Yeah. And this is a pretty good example of that. Yeah. Okay, next. Signochus for Zavitsii. Um, I just remember the first, still remember the first time I saw this species. And it's a beautiful, fascinating thing. Um, I think, Sue, this may be the one, I, if I'm thinking of, this is called the swan orchid, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. As a common name. Yeah. Um, and you see it when you look at them, they do sort of look like a bird in flight. Uh, this one still has leaves when it blooms. Um, not all of the group does, but 
Um, this is being grown very well. Um, the chlorochylum and the Vorzovitzii, um, both are being grown well. And, and let me just mention something before we go too much further. You're going to notice that you'll see a lot of species named Vorzovitzii, and it's because of a collector that literally was all over South and Central America. So we have lots of species and all sorts of genera because he collected and sent them back to, to the taxonomist and the, and the growers in, in England and Europe. And I'm not sure how many we have here tonight, but I think almost every single meeting, there's at least one of his namesakes in it. Don't, don't you wish his name had been Smith? Actually, now that I can smell it, it's kind of fun <laughs> to say, where's Vitzii? It's a good German. I, I took a lot of German in college, so I'm, <laughs> I, I'm used to spelling German words. <laughs> okay, next. Cygnodes. As I said, we have just got a bunch of these inner generics, and this one just was striking to me when I saw it. Chlorochylon by Mormodes badia. Um, this is Steve's plant, and that lip on that thing is just spectacular. But I have to say, I was taken aback by the bulb. And unless that that pot is really tiny, this is a monstrous bulb. Um, it's really cool to see. Being grown well, clearly. And and those the Zygnotes and the Zygnotes, they don't tend to have more than one. If you have two bulbs on one, you're doing really well. They don't they don't tend to cluster pseudobulbs the way the catacetums and the cloeceas do. Uh, Sue, is this one of those um, one of those plants that if you want more of them, you you literally have to separate the two bulbs before it blooms, so you'll get another sprout. Yeah, or uh, if you really wanted to multiply it, that you'd probably take that bulb and lay it horizontally on sphagnum and and work on kikis coming up from the nose. Uh. So this is one that'll do that. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. You can see that I don't grow a lot of these, but I've killed a lot of them. <laughs> um, Sue, Sue knows the trick, and the trick is to be able to dry them out, and I just don't seem to manage to do that. <laughs> Next. Paphia petalums. I'm, I'm a little surprised that more of our, our members don't grow Paphia petalums, um, but they can be a little tricky. Uh, on the left, we have Valwin by Mokidianum. Um, this is Brandon's plant. These used to be called bulldogs, and this actually is a cross between a bulldog and um, one of the newer species that's out there. Um, and uh, I still think you'd call it a bulldog just because of the shape of the flower. But you'll notice if you just look at these two side by side, one of the big differences between the bulldog and it's because of the, the parents in the background is they have nice, clean, light green leaves, whereas the parvies and some of the others have these beautiful model leaves that, that you would have as a house plant, even if it didn't flower as beautifully as this is. Um, this is Deborah Brandt's plant. Uh, a lot of people have a difficult time with these. They, they like to have nice, fresh medium uh, and if you look at the photos of their, their growth in the natural habitat, they're growing on limestone outcrops. So they're literally growing in limestone stone rock with a little bit of leaf litter all around. Um, occasionally you'll see a plant grown in a show that looks really pretty, but a lot of times the leaves don't look, uh, the plant doesn't look big, but the flower is still absolutely gorgeous. They have this big, beautiful, uh, tall stem. Nicely grown. Next. A number of uh, dendrobiums, um, soft cane dendrobiums. I guess that's your designation, huh, Sue? Well, soft cane, the nobly types, uh, uh, people call them different things. They do, and they, they come from different subgroups within the genus dendrobium. And uh, I think that one of the, the things that happens with hobbyists who are new to dendrobiums uh, or have grown one of the groups uh, is misunderstanding that the groups are extremely different in terms of their needs, um, especially with respect to, to flowering them. Um, I think I have a talk related to reflowering orchids and I devote a whole bunch of time to, <laughs> to reflowering dendrobiums just because they're so different. But I will, I will uh, note the dendrobium mini snowflake. It's a really interesting um, group that has the inflorescence coming out of the top and they still have leaves. Whereas many of the other soft stem 
drop most of the leaves or at least a portion of them uh, when they bloom. Uh, but if you've had trouble with any of this group, uh, make sure you take a look at the growth habits. See if you can figure out exactly what group it belongs to. Typically, it's not that hard if you just look at the, the hybrid and the species in the background. And if you look at the number of canes coming out of that mini snowflake in that small little pot, you could just, it reinforces what they always say about dendrobiums. They like to be packed tight. They like to be packed tight. And uh, that mini snowflake is a good example of a group that sort of burst on the scene um, I think this was, this was mostly from H&R, the first ones I saw. Um, Roy brought these to meetings where most people hadn't seen them. Um, and to everyone's surprise, they grew like weeds. And the only complaint I've ever heard about this group is they never go out of flower. I finally just <laughs> cut all the flowers off. And that's not unfounded. They just last and last and last. It's a nice characteristic, even if people do complain about it from time to time. Next. Dendrobium cena red. Um, this sort of hits a, a sore spot. Uh, that really isn't a registered name. Uh, a number of the growers in Taiwan and perhaps Hawaii, but I know Taiwan, they're not uh, registering their hybrids. They're giving special clones a name that has nothing to do with the, the parentage. And so it makes it really difficult to know what you've got when you have one of these. Um, I'm hoping that doesn't become a regular thing. There was a time where you couldn't enter any plant in an orchid show that didn't have a registered name, but I have seen a few unregistered orchids in shows. And in, in some respects, it's not really fair because you don't know what the background is. So it's hard to compare it and its background to others that you know. Um, but you get one important piece of information from this slide and and that is Bill saying that he, he just keeps sliding it into a bigger pot. And as long as the media doesn't go bad, that's not a bad thing to do because the only bad part about it is the plant gets taller and taller and you have to keep it from falling over. So bigger pots kind of help that. Just don't over pot them, that's the key. I mean, this is definitely one of the Phalaenopsis type. It's easy to, to recognize from the flowers. Next. Oncidium twinkle, variety red. Uh, this group of oncidiums um, is pretty amazing. The, the, the fragrance in just about anything in this group just knocks your socks off. I mean, and there are so many different forms, uh, color forms now that you can find. And as I said, the fragrance will just fill a greenhouse. It'll fill a house. And, and some people think it's too over, overpowering. It's too strong. Um, but not many people complain about it. They're fairly easy to grow. They like a nice uh, open medium and they like pretty, pretty good light. Um, some of them are true miniatures and others are more standard size. So depending on what area you've got to grow, you can select a size that fits you. And, and as I said, some different colors in, on these things too. Next, Miltonidium. Now it's Oncidium. Um, Pupakai Sunset is a really cute little miniature, and this is this is uh, mixed with Oncidium sotonatum, and you get an idea of the classic Oncidium look. When I think of an Oncidium, I think of an inflorescence like this, uh, and many of them do have this this form. Uh, and many of us, when we used to see um, uh, Miltonias bloom we knew they really weren't Miltonias, they were different. And in fact, they breed very, very freely with Oncidiums. And that's why they've now been combined. This is one of the name combinations that really makes perfect sense from the standpoint of genetics and everything else. Even the form of the flowers is, is similar. I think some of the, the Miltonias that were um, separate at one time, the only reason they were was the flowers were bigger and they had fewer flowers. But you see what happens when you cross it with a good Oncidium, you get a lot of flowers. Very nicely grown. This is Bob Devon's. Next. Every time I see this species, I'm just amazed at how different they can look from um, plant to plant and even time to time. Um, this is species Speciosa, Phalaenopsis speciosa. It's also called Phalaenopsis 
tetraspis. Um, it's the same species, uh, just identified multiple times. And I suspect if you were to see these in the wild, some of them purple, some of them white, some of them this with this unusual color form, um, you would maybe think they were different species. Notice one of the characteristics of the species. Typically, the petals are the same color and the sepals are the same color, but that's not the case with Tetraspis or Speciosa. Um, in this particular plant, you can see some flowers that are almost pure white, some that are almost pure purple, and just about everything in between. You'll also notice the old inflorescences that just keep blooming. That's another nice characteristic, even though you may not have 12 flowers on a stem. After a while, when that plant matures, you actually have a pretty good floral display. That's nicely grown, Linda. Everyone I know that's tried to grow this or grown this said it's, it's a little tricky. So whatever you're doing, Linda, don't change. You've got it figured out. <laughs> Next. Many, many years ago, someone in the St. Augustine Orchid Society asked me during show table, can you grow a Vanda in a pot? And just so happened I had a, a Vanda that was um, that I was getting started again. It was kind of small. And I said, let's see if this will grow in a pot so I can take a picture. That's probably been eight or nine years ago and it kind of got forgotten. And not only did the Vanda grow in the pot, but it grew out of the pot and then down. And that is the reason people don't grow most Vandas in pots because to get a Vanda to grow well, it has to get to be pretty good size in terms of the numbers of pairs of leaves. And this is a, a fairly classic uh, size. Fuchs Delight is a big purple and Vanda Tricolor is a smallish uh, Vanda as Vandas go with lots of pretty spots. And in this case, it got the best of both. Big flowers, the purple color and lots and lots and lots of spots. And it'll have 12 or 14 flowers on a stem, which is nice for, for this kind of a hybrid. Um, this is my plan. I think I got this from, uh, um, I guess Fuchs. I can't remember either Fuchs or Moats. Uh, they'd be pissed off if they knew I confused them, but <laughs> I got it from one of those places. <laughs> and then Vanda, Syriporn Pink, East Moor by Fuchs Delight. Uh, so many beautiful Vandas have, have come, you know, from the Far East. Um, it's, it's surprising that we, we don't actually see more of them. They grow so freely there. And some of the hybrids that have been produced there are, are pretty amazing. Uh, I guess maybe the good news is that many of them come in through uh, American nurseries, um, like Bob Fuchs down in Homestead. Um, he's very good at recognizing good crosses and, and importing. Uh, and often if you get there at the right time, there'll be massive numbers of these seedlings um, grown very much like you see right there with lots of leaves on them. Uh, and the only trick to them when you get them is to just make sure you can duplicate at least initially the, the nice humidity and the high heat. But this is beautifully grown. Two beautiful inflorescences be way to go. Next, more Vandas or Ascascendas. Now they're technically all Vandas. Um, and this is the more classic uh, form with the Sandarana in the background, a big round uh, overlapping petals and sepals. And it's interesting that um, all the or three of the Vandas that we have here, the big classic ones all have spots. And in the case of the one on the right, which is now Souk Salmon Gold, that's got these tessellations. And the tessellations were pretty unusual when they first started popping out, but they add a lot to, to the flower. Um, Ask a Centrum below, um, now that's a Vanda, but those of you who've been around a while, you know that the Ask a Centrums are just small Vandas um, and typically extraordinarily colorful. Uh, this one here is a species that most people don't recognize. It's Orantiacum. Um, it's beautiful. I think mine just is going out of flower. Uh, I originally found it and didn't think it was, um, I guess I bought it as mini autumn. And I was pretty sure it wasn't just because uh, of the time it was blooming and some floral characteristics. And sure enough, when I got it identified, it was a Rondiacum. But it grows very much like what we used to call a mini autumn um, or Gary Eye. I think it's now called, um, it's got another name too. But Gary Eye was, the, I think it's the proper name for Mini Autumn. Um, and don't be confused if, if you keep hearing that names have changed. Taxonomists who first find these get to name them. And sometimes 
they don't look very hard to see if somebody else has already named them. And that's really what happens to a lot of the species. Mm -hmm. But this is a separate species altogether. Grows just like many autumn, just blooms uh, in the middle of the winter. Next. Rhynchus stylus celestis. This is just a beautiful thing. The species is gorgeous. This is Brandon's. And what's really interesting about the flowers is that Brandon is growing these under lights. And it wasn't that long ago where if you'd asked any um, one who grows these, if you could grow this inside under lights and get it to flower, they would have told you, no, it's impossible. Um, Rhynchus stylus like really high light. Um, you grow it with your, your brightest vandas. So thankfully we have uh, new kinds of lights now that give the right wavelengths and lots of it. And you can grow these inside. And this is being grown well in a pot. So I'm not the only one who has grown things in pots, but it makes it easier if you're growing inside to control water and keep the moisture high. Good job, Brandon. Next. Vendica stylus, Lucinary bluebird. Um, this particular cross, Lucinary, has been made a number with a number of different parental forms. And this is the one that is uh, Cerulea. You can also get them that are pink uh, and a variety of different colors, but you could think of this as a miniature Vanda that doesn't mind lower light and grows fine inside. They also don't, don't mind cooler temperatures because the uh, Vanda falcata comes from Japan and is a cool growing thing. And Celestis is a cooler growing Vanda. Uh, but they also have this interesting characteristics is that they constantly throw kikis around the base. So instead of just having one Vandacious stem, it's not uncommon to have four or five or six when they all bloom at the same time. You can almost not see the leaves in some of these. So just a matter of getting them up to a big enough size um, and not making any mistakes in four or five years of <laughs> culture. <laughs> They will drop their leaves just like uh, regular van, the lower leaves if they're, if they're too dry. Too dry, too cold. Too dry, too cold. Somebody looks at them wrong. Um, <laughs> Suzanne's doing everything right on this one. Yeah. Next. Rhynchneroides, now Periara, Bangkok sunset. And what's critical about this is the Arides parent. Arides is a member of the Vandacious group um, typically, they have beautiful long racemes of uh, pink flowers or pinkish flowers that hang down. And when you cross it with Vandas or anything in the Vandacious group, you get these really interesting growth patterns where it's very Vandacious. Some of them can be very large and with, with wide, thick leaves, but the leaves are very close together. So they're stacked close and they produce some of the most beautiful colors. Um, depending on what Vanda it's crossed with or what Rhynca stylus, Rhyncheroides it's crossed with. But you can get this, this pattern, um, this inflorescence. And the only downside to it, and that's from the Arides, is that the flowers are really packed closely. There are a few hybrids where second generation, the flowers are separate a little bit, but you'd lose some of those, those uh, characteristics of the color. I, I will tell you the one cautionary thing about this kind of cross with an Arides is they typically take a long time to flower compared to a Vanda, a standard Vanda. So don't, don't uh, throw it out if it hasn't bloomed when you think it has or should have. They'll reach a certain size and once they reach that size, they'll flower like crazy. And again, the issue sometimes can be the size of the plant too. It could get pretty hefty before it flowers. It, I, I had an Arides this year that had 30 bloom spugs on it, but it's been in the same pot and it's huge. And it just has to be that huge to bloom like that. That was a straight Arides? It was a primary between two Arides species. Yeah. And Arides, there are a lot of Arides species and it's a shame that they're not grown more because they're fairly easy to grow. Uh, they mostly come from places like Thailand and warm, warm climates. Florida is a perfect place for them. And it's easy. You can grow them right out in the full sun here in Florida if you, um, if you acclimate them. And I, I was looking at the plant and seeing all the speckles on the leaves. And that's characteristics of Arides too, if they're in, in really good light. And that is what it takes to bloom um, the Arides and the hybrids with Arides. They have to have really good light. Next. 
Renanthera, this is Sue's plant. Uh, Renantheras are some of the most beautiful orchids in the Vandacious Alliance. And you see a, a good example of sort of the best that, that that group has to offer. The branched inflorescences, lots of flowers on each, um, each branch. Uh, the plant itself can hold huge numbers of flowers. They're fairly easy to grow. They grow just like uh, a Vanda in the Vandacious group, of course. Um, and the one thing about them I'll say is, I'm not sure I've ever seen a hybrid made between Renanthera and the Vandas that were better than the, the parent Renanthera. There's just something pretty spectacular about the, uh, the shape of the flowers. It's just very, very artistic. Um, and again, they're fairly easy to grow. Just make sure when you get one that you understand the parents and the, the size of the plant. Some uh, Renantheras get huge. I've seen some 12, 14 foot high um, with uh, wing sprans that are two and a half and three feet, and they're not for the, the home culture. Yeah. Um, but some of them, some of the species are very small and miniature and do fairly well um, in, in smaller greenhouses, but they do like a lot of light. You, you talked about growing them in pots. Uh, I used to grow this like a Vanda on the S hook and didn't do anything. I, this is probably the first bloom and I probably had this plant for five or six years. And Linda said, Sue, just you, you got to put that in a pot and pack it with, with big lava rock, and it'll be a lot happier in, with the roots in the pot than it is hanging loose. And she was right. This is the first no, that's group. that's a good point, Sue. Um, I think the, all the ones I have are in pots. Is that right? And, and part of the reason is that you know if you have them growing outside, you have to give them a lot of water, and it's hard. It's just hard to give them that much water unless there's unless you just live near near a lake and it's just moist all the time. But mostly they do better in pots, especially the smaller ones. They, they absolutely have to be in pots. Okay. And, and again, it's gotta be a medium that you don't have to you know, replace all the time. Yeah. Lava rock, uh, I've seen people grow them in big chunks of cork in a pot. Um, they will grow on mounts, but I think for most people, you'll have an easier time of it um, growing them in a pot. Yeah. Next. And Gracum eburnum. Um, this is one of the classic species of, of and gracoid. Um, and gracoids are all from Africa, uh, Madagascar, that part of the world. And this is a typical color, color form with the white lip and the, the green petals and sepals. They all have a long nectary that uh, is part of the, the pollination lure for big moths. Uh, this is one of the interesting ones in that it's really upside down compared to most of the engracoids. In other words, the lip is up instead of down. Most orchids have their lip down. Uh, but this is a beautifully grown plant. I mean, I'm just amazed at the leaves. If you've, if you've not tried to grow these, I have a hard time with them getting uh, leaf spots. The black leaf seems spots, to come. Yeah. Yeah. This seems to come with the species, but... Um, this one doesn't have a, I don't see a sign of it. So I have to ask Steve what the heck he does to, <laughs> to keep that away. Next. Pelan, Pelantantheria insectifera. <clears throat> uh, this is interesting. It's very much a vandacious type of, of growth pattern. There's no pseudo bulb here. Um, it's from India. There are quite a few species of orchids from India that have this, this sort of growth habit. Um, the flowers typically aren't spectacular. There's typically not a lot of them, but they're along the, the stem. So this doesn't have pseudobulbs. It just grows up almost like a vine. And, and the only problem with growing it is it grows up pretty fast. These are typically fast growing things, as are most of the related species. Um, insectifera, I'm guessing, got something to do with either the pollination or uh, it looked like an in insect to the, the person who described it. But you can see the roots coming out and grabbing a hold of the, looks like a piece of wood that it's grown on. Perfect for a greenhouse culture, but they're just hard to control in very small greenhouses because they love to grow up. And she's growing that outside. Well, it comes from a, a pretty warm part of India, so I'm not too surprised that it would do really well here. I remember seeing a number of different species in India 
that looked very much like this. They weren't in bloom, but um, they had that growth habit that I was pretty sure they were orchids, but there were no flowers there yeah. to, to give them a solid ID. But typically the roots give them away. Next. Bulbophyllum carianum. This is Leslie's. Um, this is a really interesting species. I had one of these escape one time. Um, <laughs> and I didn't realize it had escaped. I guess a piece of it had fallen um, off. I still had the one in the pot and it got under the bench. And unbeknownst to me, it, it just ran like crazy on the, on the floor. And the only way I ever found it was I kept smelling this rotten smell. <laughs> and uh, I knew it was a bulb of film and I didn't have any in bloom and just happened to look under and uh, and see this 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 inflorescence is what this technically is. All these little tiny flowers all massed together. Um, and if you take a picture of each individual flower, it's really very beautiful. You'll notice one other characteristic of this species. And when I found it under my bench, it had stretched uh, oh about six feet. It had run that far, so it had live bulbs about six feet. And you see the distance between the do the bulbs. It's got a, a very large uh, distance or space between the bulbs. And as you can imagine, that's not easy to keep in a pot. And it looks like this is being grown on a mount, which is the only way to do it, except under a bench. I'm on, I, I believe. <laughs> uh, Leslie's growing this, and she grows her bulbos really well. One thing to point out, and we'll talk about this in the next slide, the bulbophyllums as a group um, are, are worldwide, and they have some distinctly different kinds of inflorescences depending on the group within the bulbophyllum um, of genus you'll see in a minute that they can be extremely different that you wouldn't probably ever identify them looking at the, the, the form of the inflorescence, but they all have the cantilevered lip that bounces up and down with just a little breeze. So if you're unsure, just test that out. The other thing is they all stink, or most <laughs> of them do. <laughs> and when I say stink, they really do. <laughs> Next. Bulbophyllum liliaceum, liliaceum. Look at the difference in the inflorescence on this. Beautiful long um, uh, spikes, I guess you'd call them. Uh, lots of flowers on a, a raceme. Um, and the bulbs are nice and neat, close together. Uh, if you're gonna grow one of these and you don't have a lot of space to let them run around, this kind of group is sort of perfect. And again, it's a species and fairly easy to grow. Uh, they just like lots of moisture. And that's good for a lot of people who, who tend to overwater. Next, Bulbophyllum Cheryl Kurosaki and Bulb Fantasia. And I want to point out the parent of both of them is Bulb Fascinator. And Bulbophyllum Fascinator, I think of all the Bulbophyllums I ever had in my collection, it was one of my favorites. Not because it has huge numbers of flowers, but it's got the most interesting flowers that you can imagine. And you can sort of see those traits in both of these hybrids. It's got warts, it's got hairs, it's got just about every kind of, of twist and turn in the orchid world that you can think of. Um, and when you get one really grown well, like you see in the Fantasia, with all those flowers coming out, it's just a, a showstopper. It grabs everyone that looks at it. Um, and if you smell it, you'll find out it's for sure a bulbophyllum. Um, but you can also see the Lassiochylum in Cheryl Kurizaki um, and see what happens when you cross the two. Um, this particular species fascinator is very, very dominant in a hybrid. So while Lassiochylum had a lot of flowers, when you cross it with fascinator, you get down to usually two. But again, both being grown very well by Susan and Leslie. Next. If I had to pick my favorite species of Bulbophyllum, it's this one, Bulbophyllum medusi. I think we had one last month too, didn't we, Sue? We did, we I think did. You, you had the, the clone that I have. Um, but what I really love about these photos is you can see the characteristics of both plants uh, that make it so uh, unique. Um, all the hanging petals that come down. The hardest part about growing it is when you flower it, um, catching the the petals so that they don't get stuck somewhere. Yeah. Uh, if you've got a plant like this where it's hanging over the pot, that's when you get the sort of the best, the most beautiful 
um, flower heads. And you can see how high the, the inflorescence is. I mean, it's a tall inflorescence that really moves it up. But I will ca caution you, not every clone of this species has that characteristic. Some have very short inflorescences, so they don't really get above the foliage very well. Um, so pay attention to that characteristic if you can. The only downside is the flowers don't last a long time, uh, but it's not uncommon once you get a plant well established for them to flower a couple of times, um, sort of sequentially, yeah. not just once. And the length of the flower seems re really variable. Like these are really long, particularly Suzanne's. The thing I've observed over a lot of years of seeing many of these is the length of the petals has to do with the internodal distance between the bulbs. Oh, so yeah. if you have a big internodal distance, you seem to have much longer petals. Um, the one that was awarded a long time ago, um, I think it was an orchid glade clone, or at least that nursery, uh, Jones and Scully's plant, it was awarded at a show, which is amazing because it meant they were lucky and had it blooming at the right time. But the petals were much shorter than many of the others, but it also had these, this beautiful growth habit of the bulbs being close together. So it made a specimen plant quickly. It just didn't quite have that same um, impact of the very long petals. Yeah. But two good growers growing a beautiful species. Yeah. Next. Dendrochylum convalieriformi. I think I said that right. This is Sheila's. Oh. Um, and for those of you who, again, over water, dendrochylums <laughs> are for you. I mean, I, I grow some of these in my greenhouse just because they are very attractive. First time I saw one bloom, I didn't think much of them, but it just had one inflorescence. But then when I saw some, it shows with 40 and 50 inflorescences, I understood why people really liked them. And the ones I have in my greenhouse, I, I grow in a pot that sets in a tray of water and I just keep the water filled. Um, I don't even know what's in the medium anymore. It's kind of disappeared. Probably uh, probably, it's probably rocks. Yeah, just roots and rock. Uh, as long as they get a lot of water, they'll grow and flower. Uh, this, they're really dependable about the same time every year within a day or two. Next. This is often called the Christmas Cattleya because it blooms around Christmas. Um, this is Cattleya Percivaliana. It's a, a beautiful species from South America. Uh, and the clone that you see, Percivaliana sonia, is actually, let's see if I wrote this down, is actually Sonia de Urbano. I wondered um, about that. When I would look that up, I saw that. And I, I should have emailed you and asked if that was the same one. It's the same one. And it's, it's, I guess, a laziness factor. There are a lot of these South American names that I guess people get tired of writing tags and they just write Sonia because they'll remember what, what it was. Yeah. But this is the same thing. You'll see it offered for sale as both. It's, it's a fairly old um, clone. It's been around, gosh, at least 60 or 70 years. And um, it's, it's surprisingly hard to find, but it's the alba form of the plant on the right, which is Percivaliana summit. Uh, Summit was around 50 years before it was awarded, I think in 1976 or something like that, um, 85, 86, I uh, see my notes are. Um, and it is still one of the most beautiful Percivalianas that, that there is. It's a wild collected plant. It's got great color and it's got phenomenal size. Uh, some of you will, will see um, plants for sale that are the tetraploid version of this. When they cloned it, there were a couple that came out as tetraploids. Um, I think it's called, one is Mendenhall Summit. The other, I think is Merrill. They're both tetraploids of this. And what's interesting is many times tetraploids that arise that way are smaller than the original um, two in, the normal um, one. Um, and that's the case with this one too. Tetraploids have a heavier substance, but they're smaller. And frankly, they're not really as pretty, in my opinion, as the, as the original. And if you look at that, that um, Percivaliana summit, look how the, the lip and the column have that beautiful orangey color. That just sets them off. Uh, nicely grown, uh, Leslie. I should have known that was Leslie. Yeah. Uh, but it's a beautiful species. Would you say that that tubular lip is real characteristic? I mean, you, that you can recognize the hybrids from that tubular lip when you see it? Yeah, it, it is. Um, it's a characteristic of the species. 
and it will pop out in hybrids, mostly the primary ones it'll, it'll show. Um, and it's interesting when you look at the background, the deep background of a lot of modern county hybrids, you'll find Percivaliana in the background, but you don't typically see it as a grandparent or a great grandparent, even though some of the, the hybrids that have been made recently using Percivaliana cross with complex hybrids have been really beautiful. Uh, it just hasn't been something that hybridizers have done. And one of the reasons is that Percivaliana tends to uh, make the flowers smaller. Yeah. This is one of those species where if you see a wild form offered for sale, don't get it. The chance of getting anything that looks close to summit is almost zero. This was such an unusual size and form. Most of the ones that are collected that are wild collected are very cupped and very narrow petals. This is just an unusual form uh, that was found in the wild and has been propagated and grows real well. Uh, the other thing about it is it stays in a pot for a long time. The internodal distance between the bulbs is real small. So it lasts and lasts and lasts in the same pot. Um, you will eventually have to repot it as I learned this past year, <laughs> but it doesn't tend to crawl, crawl out over the pot um, like, like so many do. And the semi-albas are beautiful. Um, I didn't have a uh, one in bloom like that, but the Sonia is the alba form. So that yellow in the lip is not considered uh, the typo form. That's considered part of the alba um, type. Next. Labiata Sherwood Forest. When I saw this, I thought, well, that'll give me something to talk about. Um, this is one of those uh, clones that's awarded. It's got an award of merit that so many of the, the experts, shall we say, have argued that it is not a true labiata. And this is a good time to talk about what they're basing that on. And what they're really basing it on is the fact that when it produces a sheath, this particular clone only has one sheath. Most labiatas have two. So if you see a plant that's labeled labiata and there's only one sheath, there's not an inner sheath, it's not a labiata. At least that is the claim. And, and I'd say probably 95% of the time, that's absolutely true. Uh, this one, I still am not sure, but I have grown this for some time. Uh, and it occasionally will have two sheaths. And the offspring, a couple of people have self this. And the ones that I have, I got a couple of self things, they all had double sheaths. So whether this is just some sort of peculiar thing to this one clone, uh, I don't know. But the argument about it being a labiata or not is going to go on as long as there are orchid judges and orchid experts. Um, <laughs> and you take it for what it is. It's a beautiful species. Um, Leslie's growing extremely well. Looks like three flowers on one inflorescence. It's extremely uh, floriferous and it's a very sweet smelling flower. I didn't mention the Cattleya percivaliana. Is fragrant, but not everybody likes the fragrance. It's not a bad smell like bulbophyllum, but the way in which you can always identify a Percivaliana is the fragrance. It's absolutely distinct. Next. Catlia Portia Sir Jeremiah Coleman. Uh, this is a Cerulea. Um, it's an old, old clone. This is probably one of the oldest intentional ceruleas ever made. And, and Sir Jeremiah Coleman got interested in this color form. And I'm, I'm trying to remember, this is about an 80, at least 80 or 90 year old clone, as I recall. So it's been around a long time, propagated both by meristems and cuttings. It grows real well. It gets to be a pretty large plant. And it is not uncommon to have 10, 11, 12 flowers on a stem and then be very large for the, the cross. The labiata really tends to uh, improve the size and the Beringiana improves the color. Next. Nancy Off Linwood. Um, I was surprised that both of both you and Leslie had this, Sue. Uh, I got a piece of this plant oh, 25 years ago. It was labeled as 1010. Uh, Originally, uh, the nursery that grew these grew a lot of them, and it was named after Nancy Off, 
which was the ex sister in law of <laughs> one of the the sons. <laughs> so you got to be careful naming things after relatives; they may go away. Uh, but anyway, um, they have about five or six, um, most of which have just numbers, but all of them are beautiful. This is the classic white catlia. Um, Joyce Hannington is the equivalent of Bowbells, and many people think they're the same. Um, but uh, it's grown very well. They're large flowers. They can be six, seven inches easy. And the color is striking on the flower. That pristine white is just hard to overcome. Oh, and it doesn't require staking. The stems are strong and they, the flowers lasted for more than three weeks. It's just gorgeous. Yeah, these, these were actually produced after the height of the cut flower trade. Um, but they were used as cut flowers for a time because they're just beautiful and white. And the best part is they bloom at a certain time of year um, and they can be uh, controlled in terms of when they bloom. So if you really wanted these for Easter, you can you can make it happen uh, simply by adjusting the, the day to daylight time. Next. Oh, I know this one. Oh, yeah. Schroederer's cat, number two. Ruth G is another one of those great big whites. In fact, some of the Ruth G clones are, you know, eight inches in, in natural spread. Catlia schroederi is one of my favorite species. And Fred Clark had a clone of schroederi that was a tetraploid. And I got a hold of that clone. And I tried to make this cross repeatedly. I think I made this three times. And third time I got success and got these seedlings. And it was pretty funny because I wasn't, I really thought they were going to be a light lavender, a, a beautiful um, luminescent pink. But so far, every single one of them has been white with this, this beautiful orangey yellow lip. Um, there are some that almost have a solid orangey yellow lip. And once these got out on the internet, I think Sue was the first to tell me somebody had shown, had a picture of one. Um, I got so many inquiries into this thing. And I didn't let another one go. <laughs> <laughs> Sue got them. Sue got them before I knew what they were going to be. See, that's the trick. Buy seedlings. <laughs> Buy seedlings. That's right. <laughs> that, that's beautiful, Sue. That's one of my favorite clones that I've seen. Oh, yeah. Um, I've got a couple of huge ones, and Sue has a large one. Uh, one I have is almost eight. At least the first bloom seedling was almost eight inch flower. Um, they're going to all be pretty large flowers. That size. yellow goes all the way up the lip. It does, and that's a nice characteristic that is rare in the, uh, in the Alba Catlias and the white Catlias. Next. This was very interesting. This is Potnara Love Triangle, San Damiano by Chocolate Drop. And then below you see another one, there's a chocolate drop. And I wanted to ask Linda where she got that um, because Chocolate Drop is a famous hybrid Gattata by uh, Arantiaca. Uh, and there are a couple of really famous clones that almost everyone has, but a few people have remade the cross, including making it with uh, tetraploid parents and, and gotten somewhat different um, results. The original, uh, original chocolate drop is pretty tall. Um, I'd say the bulbs of my plant are probably 18, 24 inches. And this one looks like it's a little smaller. Um, and I was wondering if, if that's a tetraploid or not. Um, so Linda, if you can, if you're here and you're, you're listening, um, let me know where that came from. I'm curious about it. But one of the things that is important is nice having the chocolate drop photo and then chocolate drop by Sandy Amineno. Uh, and you can see that the nice facet of chocolate drop, uh, and that's, this probably used the Kodama clone to make this because it has a lot of flowers. Look how the color just comes through beautifully and lots of flowers. Uh, it's, hard, it's hard to fault um, chocolate drop hybrids. Yes. They're all good in terms of producing lots and lots of beautiful dark colors. And we could probably do uh, an hour on just chocolate drop hybrids and everybody would be um, searching the catalogs, trying to find them because <laughs> they're just all good. And they come in array of different colors. Recently, someone um, found a mutation where a yellow chocolate drop, which is kind of cool. I'm not sure that anyone's made hybrids with it yet, but I'm sure somebody has. I had the seedling of that and it was did not have any vigor whatsoever. Nope, it doesn't grow nearly as well. And that's probably because it's lost a chromosome or two yeah. in, uh, in all the, the cloning. 
Um, and it may not hybridize very well at all, yeah. but it'll be interesting to see. I've got it too, Sue. Mine bloomed. Did it? Was, it was yellow. Yeah. I saw some in Hawaii that looked pretty vigorous. Really? Um, yeah. <laughs> so you may just have a dud. Yeah, but I, have, I just had a dud. <laughs> Next. We enter the Brassavola section of the talk. Um, and I'm always amazed how Brassavola and all of the Brassavola um, species, when you hybridize them with the large Cattleyas, um, they all dominate for shape. And they almost all dominate for color. Um, here you have um, Cattleya laviata, which is a nice medium lavender. And this is the rubra form. So it's the very darkest of the labiatas, uh, crossed with a Brassavola yaki, which is a hybrid. And the color just goes away. And the lip is just spectacular. You get lots of spots. And I think the only downside to those kinds of hybrids is that many of them don't have a high flower count. There are some that do, um, but I've got a cross of, of uh, Nodosa by Bonanza, and that was one of the best hybrids around in the 50s and 60s. And the most I've ever had were two flowers on a stem and look very much like this. They're beautiful. They're mostly fragrant. I don't know if Alan smelled this one or not. Didn't say, but um, this is one of Alan's hybrids. Um, there are many people who absolutely love Brassavola hybrids. And wherever I go and speak, at least before the pandemic, there were <laughs> always a half dozen uh, of these kinds of hybrids uh, on the show table. Yeah. Especially because they're very easy to grow in general. Next. My Kai. If you ever want to infect somebody with the orchid bug, give them a division of Maikai because they'll grow it well. And they'll think that all of them, all orchids grow like this and you'll have them hooked. Um, this is a good, good example of, this is Maikai Luis on the right. Uh, they grow into massive plants. In fact, if there's any downside is trying to keep these things control um, and produce lots of spots on the lip the lips are beautiful on almost all of the, um, the Brassavola uh, hybrids. And on the, on the left up here are cultivars that are different. They're not the same um, cultivar. I imagine there's huge variations just thinking about what's in the background, Garanthi, Beringiana, and Nodosa. Um, I, there must be huge dif differences in the lip. Most Brassavola hybrids um, to big Cattleyas do have a lot of variation in the lip, which makes them interesting and means that you can grow more than one of them. Again, they have that characteristic of, of growing very well uh, and good plants to start with, um, good plants to grow into specimens. Um, Awanagara below, which is Maikai by, I'm not sure what that SUOL is. Um, that's, Sue, what a, that's one of those... Um... What is it, the Dialalia hybrids? I had a feeling that's what it was. Yeah. Snow ballet. And, and what it kind of in, is interesting is I've got a couple of these things around. In fact, one of them, you have too, that white one. I can't think of what its name is right now. But look at the stem on this. The stem is really nice. It really sticks up, stands up well. Pretty good flower count. Yeah. That's really, really pretty. That's Walters. That's a real nice thing. Yeah. That, that's, that's still a small plant. I'm kind of interested to see what that'll do as it grows. But beautifully grown plants here. Next. Here we have a number of crosses that have um, Brassavola in the background. Um, and the one on the upper left is crossed with Cattleya Maxima, which is an interesting hybrid that makes um, beautiful, has beautiful lips. Um, I'm not sure you could make a lip more, more beautiful than that. Uh, be interesting to see whether this gets higher flower, flower count because Maxima will have quite a few flowers. Um, that one's going to be interesting to follow as time goes by. But that's Maikai by Maxima. So it's a, um, Brassavola is a grandparent here. And then Linda's green bird down there, Binosa by Little Stars. Um, I mean, Binosa is a really beautiful thing. Uh, yellow. And this one gets a good bit of color from the Binosa. Really nice. And then island stars, little stars by Maikai. Um, you can still see those spots coming through, but the little stars is really dominating on this one um, because it's 
75% of the background there. And you can see the growth habit too. Those uh, thick leaves, um, they like to have good drainage, but they will grow into a pot and out of it very, very fast. Next. Lelia Santa Barbara Hunt Sunset, Inceps by Ensibarina. Um, Deborah Brandt growing this. I remember the first time I ever saw this hybrid and was just blown away how beautiful it was. And maybe the reason I was so surprised is because of the land, Lady Anceps parent. Most of the crosses I'd ever seen with Lady Anceps, um, it was dominant for everything. Um, but this one has doses in the other parent that are very, very um, dark and very, very bright. And you get the best of everything here. You get the color. You can't quite see the stem, but Anceps produces beautiful stems on hybrids. Uh, and in fact, there was a time there where hybridizers used Anceps uh, as a grandparent to produce cut flowers that would have much better stems. Um, and some of us are still using that little trick to get good stems, but that's just got everything. It's got color, a good stem, um, and I'm not sure how big the plant is, that could be the only downside because anceps tends to produce pretty good sized plants. Depending on the form of anceps used, some anceps are fairly small and others are very large in terms of the plant size and flower size too, I should say. Next. Melody Fair Carol, another plant with a, a interesting history to talk about. Um, this has become a fairly famous uh, clone of a famous cross. I have a book from Japan that has about 150 photos of Catlia, or now Catlia, Melody Fair. Not a single one of them is a semi-alba. This is one of those crosses that one makes, hoping there'll be a sport pop out because Catlia Horace is a lavender and Stephen Oliver Foraker is a semi-alba. That cross should produce all lavender flowers with beautiful dark lips, um, but it did produce two that are different and they're semi-albas and they breed semi-albas. The clone Carol is one and Mishima is another. And I've used the clone Carol in hybridizing and it makes absolutely phenomenal um, offspring, all semi-alba. Um, the Horace brings the shape and the Stephen Oliver Foraker is a very, very strong semi-alba. I believe that that came, that breeding was done at Hauserman many, many years ago, but they'll produce three to four flowers on a stem. The flowers are big heavy, it's, a, it's actually a tetraploid. Spectacular. Next. Yeah, it is spectacular. And that's Deborah's too. Yep. Next. This plant threw me. Uh, Garanthia orantiaca by Golden Con Color. This is called Lemon Drop. And the moment I saw this, I said that can't possibly be right. Every cross with orantiaca produces uh, open flowers. And when I, I searched for this, I looked everywhere for it. But when I finally found it, um, there is no Araniaca apparent in this particular flower. There are other clones out there, one that was awarded, and it's the more standard um, open flower that you would expect. It's, it's never a good idea to say it can't be this because I, I know of another cross with the same kind of parents, an Arantiaca crossed with a big Catlia that also was very round. Um, and I think I need to see if Bob knows more about where this one came from. I'll, I'll ask him. Yeah, it's it's possible it is some sort of uh, meristem um, sport. Yeah. They do happen. And whatever it is, that's got the beautiful round uh, shape that you'd want. The lip doesn't quite look like an Araniaca lip either because the lip of Araniaca usually has a great influence on the offspring. So we don't quite know what this is, but these kind of things are just fun to, to kind of research and, and see what one can find out. Next. This is another old one, Elsie Harold Carlson Linwood. Uh, Linwood's a name that Waldor uses. This is Leslie's um, and the breeding on this goes back to Catlia Enid, which is a primary hybrid. Um, this type of hybrid was made a lot back in the 30s, 40s. And, and by just finding really good clones to use, 
they produce some beautiful things. And what's notable about this particular clone is the, is the characteristic that we call a flare. Um, this is not coming from intermedia kinei, which has the characteristic of hold, folding the petals in, but that little splash kind of thing, um, that is a characteristic of this clone. And that's, that's why it is, uh, that's probably why it was awarded because the habit with the flower size like this is pretty unusual. And that lip, that lip just defies color. It's just yeah. all solid, and con so color, dark. And so roughly. It is, it's really a pretty lip. Yeah. A lot of people don't quite realize that that the Cattleyas themselves have these ruffly lips. Uh, I've heard people say, if it's got the ruffly lip, it's got to have um, Digbiana in it, but that's not true. This ruffle comes from the Cattleya group in general, the Labiat Cattleyas. But beautifully, beautiful plant, beautifully grown, Leslie. Next. Exotics Perfection Pink Cloud. Um, and again, we're going back to some classic breeding, drumbeat, um, is a cross that's, that's actually related to um, Melody Fair because it's got Horace as a, uh, a grandparent, that big round lavender. This is not an uncommon hybrid for the, the 60s and 70s. Um, everyone loved these light pinks with the huge lips that were yellow. And these are typically very large flowers. I haven't seen this one um, personally. But I'm almost guaranteeing you with the parents, it's a good size flower, probably um, five and a half, six inches at least. And the Mahini Yahiro is a beautiful thing that's got this lip that just shows itself. Sometimes the lip sort of hides a little bit with the flower, but this one just stands out really nice. I love seeing these old fashioned Cattleyas um, being grown well. And I call this old fashioned, it's an old fashioned type of breeding, but I'm pretty sure this is a, a newer hybrid. Next. Well, when I saw this, I was very disappointed because mine doesn't look anything like this. <laughs> I thought I the think, same thing. I think I've got about three bulbs left. Yeah. Um, this is this is now called Cattleya Cernua. It's a true miniature. And you can see the bulbs there. And you're seeing exactly how it should be grown. It should be grown mounted. Uh, it loves to be mounted. And when you mount it, it loves having lots of water. You can just pile water on it all the time, as long as it's mounted. They do not do well in pots, although I've seen them sold that way. They just don't do well. Um, but beautiful little thing. Um, it can be hybridized with, with uh, standard Cattleyas. I've got a couple seedlings in my greenhouse now. They don't grow worth a darn, but uh, that's not uncommon with the diversity of genes in the background. But this is being grown just absolutely beautifully. That's what it should look like, Sue. So you and I have work to do. Yeah, we got work to do. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Potnara Carl Gold. Um, Little Toshi is a Toshioki hybrid. And there are two things really interesting about both of these uh, crosses. The other one's Tynan Gold Canary. Got an award of merit. And it has Toshioki in the background. Um, Toshi Aoki has this interesting characteristic and it. The first of them produce these little tiny flares that you see on the petals and sepals of the tiny in gold, but they, they kept um, sib crossing these and selfing them for several generations. And they produced all these beautiful variations, many of them which were, um, had little picatees around the edge and so forth. I suspect that in doing that, they have uh, focused some uh, genetic mistakes that are popping out. And in fact, if you took either of these to a judging, the judges would probably tell you that that's virus because that is what a virus plant can look like. Now, Brandon tested the tannin gold or Cymbidium mosaic and ORSV twice. And I've done the same thing with flowers that have popped up and had this characteristic and tested them and they were negative. The good thing about it is sometimes this will go away. You'll have it once or twice um, or every now and then and it'll go away. But you'll notice the, um, the tiny in gold. If you look at the petal on the left, you can see there's like a little piece of tissue sticking out there. And that is very characteristic of an aneuploid. In other words, a, 
a plant that has extra chromosomes more than it should for a tetraploid or a diploid. And this is probably a tetraploid with extra chromosomes thrown in. And the coral gold is interesting because you've got this purplish color popping up differently on some petals uh, than the others. And again, this probably goes back to the, um, the Toshioki and the inbreeding that they've done with it. The, the original generation of Tokioki didn't do this at all because I had four or five different clones and they were all very, very clean and didn't do it. But I suspect this is coming from some of the selfings. Wow, interesting. But grow those, let's say, Glow and Brandon, grow these another year or so and see if that goes away. Sometimes it will and sometimes it won't. You just have to grow it a couple years. Next. <laughs> I love I love this. Pamela Ann Oliveros um, is just a beautiful thing. The first time I saw it, um, it looked very much like the plant on the right. Um, it was more of a lavender. Um, this is one of Ben Oliveros' favorite crosses that he named after his mom. And I think it was his favorite because it produced this wide variety of colors. Everything from what you see on the left, that, that deep salmon color, to a luscious pink. Now, here's the funny thing. The, the one on the right, that was recently awarded. Um, and it has an AM. And it wasn't awarded with a pinkish color. It had the color of the flower on the left. This is one of those clones that has the right genes um, that are affected by how cold or hot it is. So under certain conditions, you'll get pink. In other conditions, you'll get the salmon. And you can get the same thing on the same plant at different times of the year. I'm still not sure whether it's heat or cold or exactly what, but I've got the plant on the right. It's bloomed just like that on occasion, and it's bloomed with the orange color that you see on the left. The selfings of that plant, and this is a selfing, I think, isn't it? It is. It's so a selfing. The selfings came out almost all orange which is a surprise. I haven't seen any of the pink color come out in the selfings. And Ben has used it to make other hybrids and they almost all came out nice salmon colors, which is, which is a nice contrast to most of the orchids that we, we get to see. Now, I'm curious where Alan Black found that guitar body shape, um, but it makes it interesting. <laughs> and it's a shame we can't see the front of it, but the flowers are facing the other way. Oh, it's, we have some creative club members. Yeah. Here's, a, here's another Allen's plant, Barkeria skinneri. Um, this is in the Cattley Alliance. And you think about it, look at the flowers. You can see how it sort of looks like it's, it's related to maybe um, encyclias, epidendrums, um, and it is. And it will breed with standard Cattleyas. There are a bunch of hybrids around. Uh, though this is one of those things that every time I see a hybrid made with it, it flowers. My thought always is that just can't compare to the species. Um, and this is just a, just a nice species. Um, it's from Mexico and Guatemala. And one of the interesting things about a lot of the Central American species is they often grow in a variety of habitats, um, both, I guess, temperature wise and just geographically. And so many times, the different populations have different characteristics, particularly with respect to the plant growth and often even the, the flower size. Um, so this is one of those species that if you, can, if you can get some of the wild collected ones, they're really fun to grow because many times they look very different from the ones that have sort of been line bred in, uh, in nurseries. Yeah, Next. That's beautiful. It is nice. Yeah. This is one of my, my crosses. Um, these are the two parents of this are two of the most dominant things you could have as a parent. Harpophila, generally it's a, we used to call it Lelia. It's one of those, um, it's a very um, tall growing, but very thin pseudo bulbs produces inflorescence of very open yellow flowers with very narrow lips. The lip always dominates um, and so does the yellow color. Um, um, Catatonia, why not? which is Arantiaca by, um, I'm forgetting the, that Caribbean species. Somebody's memory is better than mine. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's a beautiful red purple kind of thing. It's got this beautiful big lip. And I have to admit, 
I won't say I make things out of curiosity, but I wondered who would win this battle. Um, and <laughs> it's interesting that it's a it's almost a perfect combination of the parents. And I really wasn't expecting that um, from the why not. It got a wider lip and got nice color. And the Harpophila gave it a really nice flat um, stance. Uh, still not sure how many flowers these will get. They're getting three to five now as they get bigger, but it's staying a pretty uh, miniaturized plant, which is what why not typically does. Um, the, the term flutterby was sort of a, a designation that my daughters had for butterflies. They flutter by. I was going to ask you where that name came from. Yeah, and Rose may have made it up. I just remember the, the girls using it all the time flutter by and it's perfect because they do look a little bit like butterflies as they're bouncing in the wind they have nice little inflorescences that move with the air this is glow's plant grow it up glow the only <laughs> variation in the cross has been that some have had um, almost solid red lips and then some have been almost yellow with a darker lip but it's been a really uniform cross yes pretty. next and we are done. Once again, you wasted a good hour of time um, <laughs> listening to me yak on and on and on. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully everybody got something out of it. And oh, yeah. I'm really impressed with the with the, the orchids that our members are growing now. The variety and the ability of our, our club is staggering. Um, can't wait till we actually can see these in person again. So Thank hopefully you. that won't be too long. Hopefully um, not. I know I got my first shot a week and a half ago, so hopefully the others are too. Uh, so I maybe mean, we'll be able to do this soon. When? <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not predicting soon. Yeah. <laughs> well, so one of these days, I think we'll keep doing the, the virtual in the short term, and so we'll need pictures by, by the end of the month. If, if anything comes into bloom, one of the nice things about doing this is that you get to take a picture when the plant is at its uh, perfection point rather than just what it looks like at, on the night of the meeting. So if you have something in bloom that looks really great, send a picture in during the course of the month and then we'll collect all the pictures uh, that we get by the last Saturday of the month and put them together for next month. I'm, I'm not sure that there may be reasons just to keep doing it even after a meeting in person. As you say, everyone can you know photograph the, the, the plants in their best condition uh, plus, we get to see plants um, that that would never get brought in, yep. either because they don't the flowers don't last long, or the flat the plants just too big. And from the standpoint of the person doing the show table, invariably there's something on the show table that I don't know, I've never seen before, and it is nice being able to spend some time researching the plant, particularly if it's a species. Yeah. But even the hybrids, you know, it's nice having the time to 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 look at them in in detail. Yeah. The only sad part is. There are so many wonderful photos that people send in. We can't include them all, yeah. but that's always true. The soap table too. Yeah, I mean, it, definitely. The, as far as the virtual meetings, I think the show table is the most lends itself the best to to a virtual meeting, particularly yes. with, with you as the as the um, major D. I mean, I'm sure any one of us could do just as good a job. So. Oh, I'm sure, <laughs> just as sure that only you could do it, darling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'll take the credit, but I'm, I know a number of people I think you could. I'll bet Fred Clark could handle this just fine. Yeah. Anyway, the, uh, thank you, Courtney. You're wonderful. Uh, hey, you're welcome. I, I have to admit, I'm getting to the point where I enjoy these. Good, good. <laughs> because you, you spend enough time doing them, right? That's true. Um, so for what's coming up, we've got Fr uh, Jim Roberts is going to be coming over next month. He's going to be talking about encyclias and the, with a particular focus on the Epicatlia hybrids. Uh, so that'll be the February 2nd. We're going to be resuming the repotting clinics uh, at the end of the month. I think we're going to have our first Kiki Club of the year. We're going to have a little repotting ma madness over here at uh, our house at the end of February, lots of divisions and Charlie's going to man a, a bounding station and Tom is going to man a, a basketing station and I'll man a potting station and you can bring plants to repot and we'll have divisions to repot. So that's always a fun time. And of course the Jacksonville Orchid Society show is coming up in March. Um, so if anybody wants to get involved, uh, Jacksonville would love to hear from you. So. 
Thank you, Courtney. And thank you all for being here. It's fun every month. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Be safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye, everyone. Appreciate it.